That's good. Awesome. Okay. Let P be a large prime number. Okay. There are infinite of them. Okay, for, for an integer n, let's define a function, chi of n, Greek letter chi, okay? It takes just three values, one plus one, minus one is zero. Okay, it is one if n is not a multiple of p, and x squared congruent to n modulo p is solvable. n is given, okay? We are defining kind of chi of n. What do we mean by solvable? There exists an integer x such that x squared and n, n they are the same mod p, okay? If we can find such an x, then this n is called a quadratic residue mod p. Modulo p. Minus one if, again, p doesn't divide n, and x squared congruent n is not solvable. So what do you need to call? Quadratic non-residue. <laughs> n is called quadratic non-residue, modulo p. Zero, what is the remaining case? p divides n, n is a multiple of p. Okay, we have, we have this function here, just taking three values, plus one, minus one, and zero. Let's start deducing some information about this function. Okay. First, chi of n is the same as chi of n plus kp for any k integer. That should be true. Why? Because adding or subtracting a multiple of p does not affect solvability of this congruence relation, modulo p. Right? So that's what we call periodicity, mod p, with period p. What else? By Euler's criterion, what is this? Chi n is congruent to n to the power p minus one over two mod p. This is Euler's criterion, okay? So this value is plus one or minus one, depending on whether n to the power p minus one over two is congruent to plus one or minus one mod p. So from this, can we deduce that by this fact we have chi of m n, the value of chi at m times n is equal to 
product of the values, chi n times chi n, for all mn integer. From, from this criteria, we can deduce this result, right? Why? Because this side is totally multiplicative. That's what we are going to call total multiplicativity, OK? OK, up to now, we just observed two basic information, two basic property of this function. Periodicity with period P and total multiplicativity. Okay. What else? <coughs> the size of the set one squared, two squared, three squared, etc., all the way up to P minus one squared, considered modulo P. is p minus 1 over 2. Why? We are considering the elements in this set. OK. In this set, there are p minus 1 elements. Okay. How many distinct elements do we have here if we consider these values modulo p? 1 squared is the same as p minus 1 squared mod p, right? 2 squared is the same as p minus 2 squared mod p. So the number of elements is p minus 1 over 2. So half of the size of the original set. What does it mean? This is the set of all squares mod p. So how many squares do we have modulo p? p minus 1 over 2. So the number of quadratic residues modulo p, the number of quadratic residues modulo p, is p minus 1 over 2. So the rest, yes. Mm. Three square, three square, about the same. Yeah, you are right. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the way that you can do it is you can consider start with a primitive root modulo p, right? Then then you can you can understand these guys. Yeah. But let's not get into that. Yeah, th there might be at most, how many, how many solutions can we have of this equation? You're right, yeah. We can have at most two solutions, right? By, by a theorem of Lagrange, I believe. So that's why if A1 squared is equal to A2 squared, then we can get, yeah. Okay. It's two, but, but P has to be a large prime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, P is a large prime number. The point is that, so what is this what is this sum? Here we are summing all the way up to P, the values of chi. Chi is taking values plus one, minus one, or zero. It is zero only when x n n is equal to P in this sum. So what is this sum? Half of the numbers are quadratic residues. The rest is quadratic non residue. So what is this sum? Zero. Final observation, chi of 1 is 1. x squared congruent to 1 has a solution, x equals 1 or x equals minus 1. Okay. okay, at 1, the value of the function is plus 1. What is the question that we ask now? The value is 1 at 1. Then, 2. What about the value at 2? Let's say... The value of chi at 2 is 1 again. Chi 2 is 1. Chi 3 is 1. Chi of 4 is 1. 5 is 1. What is the question now? What is the first time that we observe that this function takes the value minus 1? Okay. Let n sub p 
be the least natural number. such that the value of chi at this number is minus 1. In other words, n sub p, p is given, p is, p is given. n sub p is a function of p. n sub p is, is the first quadratic non-residue modulo p. First positive quadratic non-residue modulo p. Okay, okay p is large. Let's consider p as a variable that tends to infinity, okay? This is a function of p. As p goes to infinity, what is the rate of growth of this function, n sub p, okay? That's the question that we will attack. Or at least, can we find an upper bound for this quantity n sub p in terms of p as p goes to infinity, okay? Vinogradov's conjecture. What is the date? 1918. Exactly 100 years ago. For any epsilon arbitrarily small, one can find a constant depending on epsilon, a positive constant, such that n sub p, the least quadratic positive non residue, modulo p, is at most this constant times p to the epsilon, epsilon is small, arbitrary small. This is Vinogradov's conjecture. What is this saying? As p goes to infinity, np is at most p to the epsilon for any small epsilon, arbitrary small epsilon. Okay. Let's introduce a notation. n sub p is less than less than sub epsilon p to the epsilon or or let's, let's say n n p is equal to big O sub epsilon of p to the power epsilon they both mean the statement above Here we are introducing the big O notation or the asymptotic notation, less than, less than, okay? It means for any epsilon, there exists a constant that de may depend on epsilon such that mp is less than or equal to that constant times p to the epsilon, okay? This is the big O version of this statement, okay? So let's understand what, what this is. Big O of p to the epsilon represents a quantity that is bounded above by a constant times p to the epsilon, okay? Is this notation okay, clear, the meaning of it? Because in a minute we are going to be playing around with, with this notation like a toy, right? Good. Theorem 1. We never know, the same year. MP is bounded by P to the power one over two times square root of E, Euler's constant, E plus epsilon. Since we introduced the formal statement of, of, of this shape, I'm not writing that for all epsilon there exists a constant, etc. Okay, but what I mean is clear. I hope. Okay. If, if there's a question, just ask. Yeah. You see, this power is 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 a constant, one over two times square root of e. But what is this conjecture? It should be bounded by any small power of p. But here we have this guy here and also plus epsilon. So this, this conjecture is demanding a lot of things. Right? In order to prove this, we need another theorem. 
which is an inequality, which is in the title. This is the polia and we know what all. Independently, it is saying this. Okay, let's be precise a bit. For any x less than p, there exists a constant, a positive constant, such that for any x less than p, the size of a partial sum of the values of chi is bounded by this absolute constant, independent of x and p, times square root of p times log p natural logarithm with base e. So what is this in terms of big O notation? That is n less than equal to x, x chi of n is bounded by square root of p times log p. Because the meaning of this notation is the existence of this kind of an absolute constant. That's why we don't need to write it here. Or, in other words, you can write this is equal to big O of square root of P times log P. Are we okay notationally? Yeah. This one? Okay. What do you, what do you want to understand? P... P grows, okay? P goes to infinity. What is the rate of growth of the least quadratic non-residue modular P as P goes to infinity? How, how large can it be? That's the question, right? So if P goes to infinity, P is our actual variable here. But this constant is just an absolute constant which is independent of all the other variables, X and P. So that's why if we, we cannot put it here, okay? What we are interested in is the rate of growth of this. Okay. So let's say that x is equal to p over 2. How many terms are we summing here? p over 2, many terms there are. Right? But what we get is square root of p times log p. So there are some cancellations going on here. We are summing plus 1 or minus 1. But there's, there's some cancellation here. Okay. Any questions about the statements of theorems? Can we find what? Yeah. Can we find what? Hmm. Not exactly. The reason is that, okay, chi 1 is 1. Let's say chi 2 is 1 too. So we are summing up to x, right? If we can determine that, let's say this is x, if, let's consider this as a function of x. If we can find the least x such that this function of x decreases by 1, then, then it is n sub p. But this is saying that for any x, this is bounded by this. We cannot deduce the first x that this function decreases by 1. Is it, is it clear? So we cannot deduce uh, directly what mp is. And in fact, our aim is to find a, just an upper bound for, for MP. We are not able to find its exact value in terms of P. So, so this constant is not important. What we are interested in, the rate of growth of NP as P gets larger and larger, okay? So the rate of growth is bounded by a fixed power of P, but the conjecture is that power can be arbitrarily small. Proof of theorem one. Okay. 
assuming theorem 2. Assume that chi n is equal to 1 for all natural numbers n up to some variable y. And take a real number between y and y squared. Let q denote a prime number. Write the partial sum up to x, chi of n, as sum of two partial sums. Now we are talking. What happened here? If you see this kind of a sum for the first time, just don't worry, OK? Don't worry. Let's understand its meaning, OK? Its meaning. Meaning, meanings, meanings are important, not names, not symbols, okay? What is this Q? Let's keep this in mind. Let's forget these two lines, okay, for a moment. Let's keep this in mind that Q denote, denotes a prime number, okay? This sum is ranging over all natural numbers and up to X, that's okay. But there's an extra condition here. What is this? Q divides N implies Q is less than Y. It means that if there exists a prime number q dividing n, then that prime number should be less than or equal to y. y is just a variable, okay? Less than x. This is the sum over all y numbers. Yes, exactly. Again, if q divides n, then q should be less than or equal to y. This means that we are considering all natural numbers n here such that all the prime factors of n are less than y. And it's a natural number, right? We can factorize it in uniquely, but we want to sum over all natural numbers such that all of their prime factors are less than y. What is the remaining case? All prime factors are less than y, negate it, take the negation of it. There exists a prime factor of n such that, st such that, q is greater than y. So we are splitting this one sum into two parts. Is it okay? Okay. Let's give them some name. S sub one plus S sub two. S one is this sum. S two is this sum. Right. Let's understand these sums. If n is a quadratic non residue. Okay. S1. What is the property of those n being considered here? All prime factors of n are less than y. What is the property of y? Now, now let's consider these two lines. Okay. Y is a variable such that we assume chi of n is 1 for any natural number less than y. Okay. So if this n is composed of only primes less than y, and this function is totally multiplicative, what is chi of n? 
What is it? One. Yes. Okay. So we can replace this by n less than x q divides n implies q is less than or equal to y one. Okay. Let's write it in this way. What do we do? Here we are considering some natural numbers such that all of their prime factors are less than y. This is the number of all natural numbers up to x minus the rest. This is the rest. Okay? So that's why they are equal. All right. We know that the numbers that are being considered here, n, there exists a prime factor that is greater than y, okay, q. So instead of n, let's write q, n equals q times k for some k. Okay. And let's split this one sum, one summation, into a double sum over q and k, q and k. What are the conditions on q and k? Q is a prime number greater than y, but it should be less than x, because n is less than x. What is n? n is qk, q times k. So q times k should be at most x. And it's a double sum. OK. So let's first sum over q. and then sum over k. What is the condition on q? That's what, what we ask. What is the condition on q? It is between y and x. So here we are summing over prime numbers between y and x. k, if q times k is at most x, then k is at most x over q. We are summing 1 all the time. And this is equal to x minus the same sum, floor of x over q. Because this sum is counting the number of natural numbers up to a threshold, x over q. This is floor of x over q. Are we OK up to now? Similarly. S2 can be written as a sum over prime numbers between y and x, chi q, and the inner sum is again over k up to x over q, but we are summing chi k this time. Okay. What we did is basically this trick again, splitting one sum into a double sum by writing n equals q k. And if n is qk, what is s2, by the way? s2 is this sum. If n is qk, chi of qk is the same as chi of q times chi of k by total multiplicativity. So that's why we, can, we were able to separate them. Okay. Now, let's find an upper upper bound for this, this threshold here, x over q. q is at least y. So instead of q, if we write y, we get something larger. Now, what is the relationship between x and y? Let's go back to the beginning of the proof. x is less than or equal to y squared. So x over y is less than y.
So here we have chi k, k is at most x over q, but x over q is at most y. So k is less than y. If k is less than y, what is the value of chi k? If one, why? Because of this assumption. Good. Okay, let's keep this. So, the partial sum up to x of uh, this function, chi, is at least floor of x minus sum over prime numbers between y and x of floor of x over q twice by triangle inequality, inverse triangle inequality. This sum is this plus this one. S1 is this guy, x minus one of one of them. Here, S2 is this, but this is at least minus one. If it's at least minus one, and if we sum this by this, we get minus two. All right. Now let's use floor of t is equal to t plus big O of 1. So what we get is, again, a sum over primes here. But this time, we are summing reciprocal of primes plus big O of x over log x. But also, we are using prime number theorem, or at least an upper bound for the number of primes. OK, now this notation is important, okay. big O notation. Floor of t is number of integer. T is, t is a positive real number, OK? Number of natural numbers up to t is, it can be approximated by t plus big O of 1. What is this big O of 1? It, it represents a quantity that is bounded by a constant times what we write inside O, big O. So this, is, this represents a bounded quantity. Okay? If you make an error term here, big O of 1, we have to sum these error terms by this much, right? How many terms do we have here? Remember, Q is a prime number. Q denotes a prime number. So this sum is over prime numbers. How many prime numbers are there up to x? x over log x by the prime number theorem. This is prime number theorem. Okay. So that's why this expression here. All right. So from here. This is a sum over prime numbers, but we are summing reciprocals of primes. Do we know how they behave, reciprocals of primes? Yes. Q up to t, summing, over, summing of 1 over q, is equal to log log t, double log, log log t. So sum of reciprocals of prime numbers up to the threshold t behaves like log log t okay? by a result of Merten. Right? Plus a constant, plus an error term, 1 over log t. 
So what is the behavior of this? Sum of reciprocals of primes up to x, it behaves like log log x. But we have to subtract sum of reciprocals of primes up to y. If we subtract it, we, we are subtracting log log y. So log log x minus log log y is this expression. Log of log x over log y. And the same error term. Good. Any questions? This one, right? Yes. So here we are making an error term of 1 over log t. What is t, for example, in this case? t is x, right? If we make an error here, at most 1 over log x, we are multiplying that error by x. That's why we have x over log x. One error term of order x over log x, another error term of x over log x, we can denote it by big O of x over log x. Yes, but y is at most x. Do you remember the thing that I wrote? Y is at most x. So the setup was y is here and q is a prime number. Q denotes a prime number in general. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was the other way around. Good. So, what is all, all these things? This partial sum of this function up to x is at least this quantity plus an error. Good. And we assume that chi n is equal to 1 for all n less than y. Now, if x is equal to square root of p times log squared p, this square will be important in a minute. If this is this, then by theorem 2, we have 1 over x, and this partial sum up to x is at most 1 over log p. Why? Let's not consider this constant here. And let's use asymptotic notation. This is true for any x here. Here we are dividing by x, 1 over x. But x is square root of p times log squared p. So we are dividing this quantity by square root of p times log squared p. That's why we have one more log in the denominator here. Okay. All right. But if y is greater than x to the power 1 over 2 times square root of e plus epsilon, then 1 minus 2 times log of log x over log y is at least 1 minus 2 times log of 1 over 1 over square root of e plus epsilon. So if we decrease y, okay, then log y is decreased. It's in the denominator, so this, this portion is increased. So log is increased. Because of this minus sign, the whole expression decreased. Okay? Instead of y, let's write this expression. Log of this, this will drop. Log x, there will be a log x in the denominator. They cancel. So what remains is this expression. If we don't have this epsilon here, what is this value? <coughs> oh, no, one, negative one. So 
subtracting one, so zero. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> it's zero. Good. If you don't have this epsilon, it's zero. But if you have this epsilon here, it is positive. It is small in terms of epsilon, but it's positive. What is this expression? Why do we consider this expression? Because this occurred here as a lower bound for the partial sum. This is at least this much times x, but we, we divide it by x everywhere. Okay. Okay. On one side, we have that 1 over x times this is at most 1 over log p. But on the other side, the same expression, this one, is at least this much. And this is positive. Can this be true? No. <laughs> For large p, this cannot be true. Be you see, p is large. 1 over log p, it goes to infinity. Log p goes to infinity, 1 over log p goes to 0. So if p is sufficiently large, then uh, stating that this quantity is at least this much should be wrong, because this is independent of p, and it is positive. Since 1 over 1 over square root of e plus epsilon is bounded by 1 over log p is not true for large prime p. We reach a contradiction. Hence, y is at most x to the power 1 over square root of e plus epsilon. What is x? p to the power 1 over 2 times log squared p to the power 1 over square root of e plus epsilon, which is bounded by the claimed upper bound. What happened here? This is a very strange proof. Why? Mm, no. Uh, no, no. We can pick log cube. Yeah. Log cube two. Or log log p two. Yeah, we can pick log log p two. Why? Hmm. Yeah. What is the condition on y and x? Okay, x is less than y squared. What is x? p to the 1 half times log squared p. What is y? Okay, so from here, what do we know? Which one is stronger? y is, let's not consider epsilon for a moment. Which one is a stronger assumption? y squared is greater than x, y is greater than x to the power 1 over 2 times e. So let's take this here. y is greater than square root of, square root of x. But here we have square root of e, which is greater than 1. So 1 over 2 times square root of e is less than 1 over 2. So this is saying that y is greater than some bound, but this is saying y is greater than some, some bound which is less than this one. Right? So this, this should be true. Right? Because if this is true, then if this is true, then this is true. Right? So this condition is true. Okay. Right? Is it okay? okay? This is a strange proof. The reason is that we read this proof by contradiction as a, as a method. Right? But the contradiction occurs asymptotically for large primes. So the absurdity occurs 
when p is so large, because if p is so large, then this is this. There exists a p, a large p, such that this quantity is less than this one. That's why this is not true. Okay. Any questions? What is this? By by saying this, you mean this? Or? Like if you, you prove that you cannot have y greater than one over like x to the power yes. of this contradiction thing, mm -hmm. is it saying that you yes. think that x is Yes. Our assumption is that if y is greater than x to the power one over square root of e plus epsilon, right? That was our assumption. Mm -hmm. This expression is this one divided by x, right? Good. But, but this is a good question. Very good. So we are dividing this by x, right? If we divide this by x, this is gone. We have this. But if we divide this by x again, we have 1 over log x. As what, is, what is our actual variable that goes to infinity? p, right? As p goes to infinity and x is somewhere around p, then this goes to 0. So that's why this is not important, but this quantity is positive. Good question. That's great. We didn't have time to, to prove. <laughs> we didn't have time to prove theorem two, but that's okay. You know, like, because the reason is that proving this is harder than proving this. Okay, that's why I, I pulled this in, in front. Okay. Any questions about this argument? Can you, can you, can you give me a bit of a picture, or some idea how Polya mm -hmm. proved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, proved sure. Two? Yep. It is because of this. Where let's use P B here. And <laughs> what's going on here? First, we define a function, tau chi, just a function of chi, OK? So it, it has nothing to do with p for now, OK? It is defined by a sum up to p, this is a full sum, of the values chi b times another function, e of b over p, where e of b over p is e to the power 2 pi i over, 2 pi i times b over p, okay? This is called a Gauss sum, all right? Then, what we can show by using, so, is this guy periodic? This is periodic with period q, right? What about this? e to the power 2 pi i b over p. This is also periodic with period p. So we are considering this expression as a periodic function of p. And by using periodicity, we can find, we can approximate the value of chi at one particular point by this expression, 1 over tau chi, times, again, a sum over some periodic functions, complex periodic functions. This is the first step. The second step is showing that this Gauss sum, this expression, here we are summing p values, but its modulus is square root of p. It means that there are some cancellations here because of this exponential. Exactly. Because we are working with uh, prime modulus, that's why. So this guy is 1 over square root of p. We are going to sum this over n, right? If we sum this over n, and if we take this summation over n inside here, what do we get? We get a geometric sum. e to the power 2 pi i 
a n over p, if we sum over n, then this is a geometric sum. And we have a closed formula for that geometric sum. The way that you can handle with partial sums of this is using that geometric sum. Is it okay? I wrote it here, but we didn't have time. <laughs> That's okay. What is known? Let, let me just mention this one. This is not the best bond. That was proved 100 years ago. This is not the best bond. The best bond is replacing this number 2 by 4. And this is a huge difference. <laughs> That's life. You know. Yeah, maybe I should stop here. Uh, who, who proved this? Uh, Burgess. Okay, uh, 1950s, around 50s. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Here. So the Riemann hypothesis should, should appear at some point. <laughs> so what do we know on your Riemann hypothesis? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Linux. On GRH, so not only Riemann hypothesis, but the generalized Riemann hypothesis. On the generalized Riemann hypothesis, we know MP is bounded by P to the epsilon. So we know Grudov's conjecture is true. <laughs> on GRH, on GRH, what is GRH? This is a complex plane. On this side, we define a function, Ls chi. S is a complex number. This is going to be a function of chi and a complex number, S. It's going to be defined by a sum, chi n over n to the S. So the coefficients are given by chi n. We are summing reciprocals of n, but on this side. So real part of S is greater than 1. Okay? This is a Dirichlet L function. One can analytically continue this function to the other part, all right? GRH is the statement that if this function is zero somewhere here in this infinite strip, okay, this is zero, this is one. If it is zero somewhere here, then it sh that zero should be on this line. That's what the generalized Riemann hypothesis is, okay? If this function defined originally here, has a zero here, then that zero should be on this line. This is called the critical line. If this statement is true, then MP is bounded by P is epsilon. This is Linux. What is interesting is that if GRH is true, then MP is bounded by log squared P. So more is true. Which one is larger? P to the epsilon or log squared P? P to the epsilon is larger. This is smaller, so this is a better one for MP. So if GRH is, is true, the least quadratic nonunicity is very small in terms of P. So the last result is actually the one that I'm familiar with, but I actually thought that, that it was proven by the back, B, A, C, H. But I might be, really? I, I guess I'm, I, might, I might be wrong. Because that's, well, maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe he improved it or something like that. But I remember maybe. that Bach has something, has like yeah. also found this log b squared. Ah, thing. Yeah, I'm going, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's, maybe it's newer. This is, yeah, this is, this is again somewhere like 60 years ago or something. Uh, okay. Yeah, it is uh, the best known constant, I guess, is one over one over three. <laughs> <laughs> there are some people working on improving. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's one over three. Yeah. So, so G 
GRH isn't known when I plug in my chi equals one, because that's just three minutes, right? Yes. Are there any chi's for which it is known? No. You can't even pick up a single event. No, no, no. Unfortunately not. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> What is the average? Yeah. Uh, what is the advantage of having? Yeah, sure. Hmm. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah, that's hard. That's hard. The reason is that that's hard, but we can have a feeling. Okay. This is equal to product over primes yeah. of one minus chi p over p to the s to the power minus one. Okay. The connection between such functions and prime numbers is basically this. We can represent this function in this side when, sig when real part of S is greater than one. We can connect the values of this to the values of the infinite product over primes. So if you take logarithm of both sides and take logarithm inside and expand logarithm of one minus some small thing, then you are going to get a sum over prime prime numbers. That is the connection between such questions and some zeros of this. Because you take logarithm at some point. So you want this function to be to be to be non-zero there. That's that's at most I can say like you know. But this is the reason. This is the connection between this function and prime numbers, this product. <laughs>